All right. So, so um, Linda, uh, I would like to welcome you to this um, to this webinar uh, in the Danish Zoom room. Um, I'm grateful for for your showing up for very for various reasons. Uh, first of all, of course, because you volunteered to do it, and secondly, because you had the flexibility to stand in and uh, for for uh, Judith and Christine. Uh, uh, who both of them were, were occupied by other, other matters. And uh, I'm very thankful for that. Um, for those who haven't met you, uh, uh, most, of, most of, of the persons that are here met your husbands back in November. Uh, and we had a delightful webinar together with him. Uh, and uh, uh, for those who, who, who uh, don't, haven't heard about Linda, Linda has, is married to, to uh, Bill and uh, uh, working as a psychologist for 37 years, as I looked up on your website, and have been working with uh, uh, the principal for more than 15 years. Um, I think that's probably correct, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. And, and I personally met you uh, the first time in November 14 in Salt Spring Island, where you were on the stage together with Bill and Elsie and, and uh, Chip. And, and one of the things that I really have been looking forward to is where if you would be kind enough to tell about the experience you had with a catatonic uh, uh, patient. And I thought, I thought that was the most touching story I, I, I have heard and the most um, beautiful um, account of how people can relate to one another without saying very many words. So if, uh, if you would like to start out with that, I, I think that would be a great way. And, and if you, uh, after that, um, we'll talk a little bit about how you look at Corona uh, situation from a principal point of view. I think that would be beautiful. Okay. But thank you. Thank you very much for showing up. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And I'm glad I could step in. I'm grateful that I had a client who was willing to reschedule to a little bit later so I could do that. Um, so yeah, I, I will be happy to share the story of the man uh, I worked with because it taught me so much. And, and it's also in my upcoming book, which will be out sometime. But um, so this occurred during my training years as a psychologist. So it's, it happened a lot of years ago and before I knew anything about the principles because I, I came to the understanding when I met Bill in 2003 and um, we got married, we met on Valentine's Day and got married six months later. So it was a very quick courtship. I kind of knew he was a goodie, you know, a, a, a keeper. And um, so this was before that understanding. And, and I was assigned to see a man who was on the psychiatric unit where I was doing a rotation. And I didn't know very much about him. The only thing my supervisor told me was that he was catatonic. And what that means is that he was in a, a kind of an interesting state of consciousness where he was in a sense frozen, paralyzed. He, he could walk uh, to some degree, but there was no responsiveness. Um, they, he wasn't eating. They were having to, you know, to feed him with liquid nutrition. Uh, he, he was just, um, in a psychic sense, he was not available, even though he had some degree of physical capability. And so the first thing I said to my supervisor was, oh my gosh, Dr. Tom, how in the world do I work with someone who doesn't speak? How do I work with someone who's frozen? And Tom, you know, wore glasses that look like this. And he looked over his glasses and he said, you're a very competent clinician, Linda, you'll figure it out. And, and so I thought, okay. <laughs> So the first time I went in to see him, I was in a little room, the orderly sort of almost half carried, half dragged him in uh, and sat him down in a chair. 
and I attempted to talk with him and, and of course I didn't get any response, but I felt like I had an obligation as a clinician to try to engage him. So I kept talking to him and nothing, nothing, nothing. And after 45 minutes, much to my relief, the orderlies came and they said, his time is up <laughs> and they carried him out. And I think that went on like three sessions and maybe the fourth session, I was seeing him every day I thought this is obviously not working. And, and I, I was sitting there with him and I thought, well, you know, human beings communicate. That's how we get to know each other. And that's how we share. And that's how we have empathy. Is there any way that he is communicating? And it's interesting that that came to me in the stillness and the quiet. I, I remember just sort of sitting there looking up at the leaves dappling the ceiling. There were windows very high in the room because they didn't want to have the patients escaping. So they were high windows. And it was kind of a beautiful pattern of leaves on the ceiling. And I'd been watching them for a while, just in sort of this reverie or meditation. And this question about, well, how is he communicating came to my mind. And I thought, oh, the only thing I can think of is that he's breathing. He's breathing. And so I'm going to breathe with him. So I talked to him. I said, I said to him, I'm going to pull my chair close and a little bit to your side. I don't want you to be afraid. And But the reason I'm doing that is that I, I want to see your breathing so that I can at least be in the space with you and breathe with you. And so I kind of got sideways to him and I could see just a very little bit his breathing underneath his shirt and I started to match it. So I just was breathing. He was breathing really shallowly, but kind of slowly. And so I don't know how long that went on. It wasn't super long, maybe a minute. And I started to be aware of being filled with this very heavy feeling, suffocating feeling. And it got harder and harder, bigger and bigger, the feeling in me to the point that it was really super uncomfortable. And I, and I remember thinking, what is wrong with me? Uh, this is bizarre. Is, am I sick? Is something happening? This doesn't feel good. I felt so weighted. And, and then I heard in my mind, this is not yours, it's his. And I was really startled by that. And I thought, wow, that explains why he's catatonic. He's carrying this incredible weight. He's just frozen under this, this, this feeling, this, this feeling of being very heavy and very, very weighted. And tears came. I, I remember just being very tearful and, and not almost not being able to speak. But as soon as I kind of had this sense that it wasn't mine, that what he was experiencing was his, and I was being given an opportunity to, to feel and see it, I, I, I was a little free of it and I, I found my voice. But what came out of me at that moment was just pure mystery. And I, I said to him, I, I don't know why you're feeling this, um, but I have the sense that you're feeling this incredible weight and this incredible pressure and this very, very deep sadness. And my heart just goes out to you. And I want, I want you to be free of it. I want you to be free of it even for a little while. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do, if you can, is give me, give me this weight, give me this sadness and free yourself of it. And I will take it into the chapel and lay it at the feet of Jesus and stay with it all night. I'd like to hold it for you. And, and there was no response, nothing that I saw that indicated that he heard me uh, and or, or had, it, had, had any awareness of what I'd said. And it wasn't long after that, that the orderlies came and they took him. And I sat there and I thought, I'm gonna be really honest. I thought, holy shit, I have just done something that could get me into huge trouble. I have mixed psychotherapy and religion. And I thought I was raised Catholic. So Christian, so to speak in 
terms of Jesus wasn't foreign to me, but it wasn't part of my, it, it wasn't really how I uh, felt my spirituality at that time. And so for me to say that I was going to take something and lay it at the feet of Jesus was not normal to me. It was not something that I would have thought to do. And, and I was sitting there in like a wash in this, oh my goodness, where did that come from? And then it was this sort of sense, Linda, you promised this man that you have to do it. And then I had a lot of thought about, oh my goodness, I'm going to spend the whole night in the chapel. Uh, like, I don't think so. I have a little girl and a three-year-old daughter and I have a husband. I've got to get home and feed them. And so, but I thought, no, I promised. And so I called my husband and I said, Jim, I, I was married to my first husband at the time who subsequently died. And I, I said, I've got, I did this thing and I told him what it was. And uh, I, I got to stay here tonight in the chapel. Can you, can you manage Laura and, and take care of things? And he said, sure. And he had formerly been a Roman Catholic priest. So the notion of, of taking something to a chapel to lay at the feet of Jesus was not foreign to him. And he was willing, very willing to support it and understood it. And he said, no, don't worry. So just take care of yourself. Linda, I worry that you're going to be up all night and, and, um, you know, do what you need to do, but just be careful. And so I, I finished my work that day. And then I went to the chapel and I stayed there all night and I just prayed. And, and I, you know, I would have, I was just the sort of in these moments where one minute I'd be really present and I'd be talking to Jesus. And I would say, you know, this man is really hurting. Please relieve him of this hurt or help me know how to do that. And then my mind would wander and then I would come back to it. And, but I was there all night. And, and in the morning, I, uh, I took a, a break, drove home, got a shower, got a little breakfast, uh, and then came back to work. And I went on to the psychiatric unit um, in the morning, and I walked into the nursing station, and the nurses said to me, um, are you you're here to see so-and-so? And I said, yes. And one of the nurses, the charge nurse, the head nurse, looked at me and she said, what did you do to him? And I got ter terrified and I thought, oh my God, he's committed suicide. And I said, did he hurt himself? And she said, good God, no. She said, after he left you, they went, took him back to his room and they went to put him into bed and he sat up and he started to speak. And he said, I'm really hungry. I need some food. And then they took him his medication a little bit later and he said, I don't need the medication. I'm going to sleep peacefully tonight. And he did. He slept through the night. And then he woke up in the morning and went into the day room, the kind of gathering community room on the unit. And he was, they said, he's sitting talking to the other people on the unit. He's waiting for you. And I, and, and so the nurse said, what did you do to him? And I just, that I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I was not about to confess what I had done. So I, I went in and I, I got him and uh, took him into the counseling room. And the first thing he said to me was, did you do it? And I said, yeah, I did. I took, I took your concerns and I laid them at the feet of Jesus and I prayed over them all night. And he said, I knew you would, I, I knew you would, I knew you made a promise that you would keep. And then he started to cry and he said, no one has ever cared for me so deeply before. There has never been anyone in my life who would have cared enough to spend all night in a church so that I wouldn't be in pain. And, and he looked at me and he said, I have been in psychiatric facilities so many times and I've tried so many times to end my life. 
And one of the things that happens every time I come into these psychiatric places is that they want to take me into the past and they want me to go over all of the traumatic things that I experienced growing up. And I'm not going to tell you today the nature of the story just to protect him. Uh, and I don't want to make something up, but, but let me just say that it was one of the worst stories, if not at that point, the worst story I have ever heard from another human being about what human beings can do to each other, especially to children. And he looked at me and he said, I know you want to help me. And I said, well, how can I help? What can I do? And he said, there are three things you can do, Dr. No, I did. There are three things you can do, Linda. I wasn't a doctor then. And he said, so I want you to, what I want is a set of teeth. He had no teeth. I want you to help me learn me to read. And I want you to help me read the holy book. And I looked at him and I said, I can do all those things. And so I got a dentist in the local community to come and work with him to fit him with a set of teeth. I got him hooked up with a literacy tutor and uh, another, uh, a church donated a beautiful Bible for him. And I talked with him for a little while. I don't even remember what we talked about or, I mean, I don't remember it being that profound, but, or that long, because I just didn't keep people in psychiatric facilities that long at that point. And so he left and I went on and about six months later, I was doing a rotation through a, a, a far county uh, mental health center. So a rural outpatient center. And I went into the waiting room to, to get my next client. And I heard this voice say, Linda, Linda, and I turned around and, and initially I did not recognize him. And there was, a, there was an African-American man sitting next to him who had a collar on. That's what I remember, the African-American man and this sort of slight man that I didn't recognize. And he said, remember me? I'm the man you prayed for all night in the church. And I looked at him and I said, oh yeah, I do remember you. He said, do you have a minute? And, and I said, yes. And, and so I, I took him back and the man who was with him into my office. It turned out the man was his literacy tutor and he was a minister. He had been assigned to a literacy tutor who was a minister. And so the minister had helped him learn to read the holy book. And they were having regular conversations about the holy book, especially the Psalms and especially the New Testament. And so the man, the, the man I'd been with, I had prayed over said to me, can I, can I show you something? Can I read you my favorite Psalm? And he opened the holy book to um, the Psalm. Uh, I, I don't remember the number, but the one about the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And he read the whole Psalm to me, tears pouring out of his eyes. And, and he looked at me at the end of it. And he said, I am whole. I am whole. I am okay. I'm going to be good. My life has meaning. And then he smiled at me with this big, beautiful smile and showed off his teeth. And he said, do you like my teeth? <laughs> I said, I love your teeth. <laughs> they just light up your face in that beautiful smile. And that was it. I never saw him again. So, uh, I don't know exactly when I did this. I th suspect it was not long after I prayed in the chapel because the man got released from the psychiatric unit and I went to see my supervisor, Dr. Tom. And uh, Dr. Tom had said to me, kind of had this stern look on his face. And he said, I heard that so-and-so got discharged from the psychiatric unit. And I thought, oh no, here it comes. And, and, and he said, so, what was your clinical intervention? And I thought to myself, oh God, do I tell him or do I lie? And I thought, no, I'm going to tell him. So I said, Dr. Tom, I started to breathe with him. I had this insight that that was the only way he was communicating. I started to breathe with him. I got filled with this incredible feeling of sadness and pain and weight more than anything. And so I told him I was going to take his concerns 
to the chapel and lay them at the feet of Jesus and pray over them all night. And so Dr. Tom says, and did you do that? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I did. And, and I did, and I prayed all night and, and then this beautiful thing happened. And, you know, what I did is documented. I got him a dentist and a tutor and a holy book. And, and it was really a beautiful thing. Dr. Tom adjusted his glasses um, and he looked at me and he got a little smile on his face and he said, I knew you would figure it out. Put his glasses back up and we went on and talked about other things. And it was such a beautiful, such a beautiful experience for me. So what I learned from that was one, trust what comes to you in stillness. Trust what comes to you in stillness. And in stillness, there are no boundaries between our spirits and and the spirits of others, none. And we can access incredible information uh, in that no boundary state. And another thing I learned was you do not have to take people into their pasts to help them heal. If you listen, they will tell you what they need. And sometimes what we think what they need is not what they need, but they know. And he knew. And he gave it to me, simple, straight up, pure. And thankfully, I was in a place where I was able, a, a, an agency where I was able and was supported in giving him that support. And, and I think the other thing I would say is that I, I saw very deeply that day the power of love. The power of love, because I really think that love guided me to say what I said, to step outside my own conceptual thought system about what was okay or not okay, uh, and, and to feel that I needed to, 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 to be true to that promise, and then to go and spend that time uh, in the chapel and, you know, and praying uh, to really follow through with another human being on what I said I would do. So it was a really, really beautiful experience. But I, I didn't tell very many people about that at that time. Certainly my supervisor knew and uh, you know, my husband knew, but I didn't share it very much because I don't, I didn't really have language for it. I mean, I, I mean, I was smart enough to know that that was not, that was not an intervention that I was probably going to use with very many people. I mean, that would have probably got me in real trouble <laughs> in, in a lot of different ways. If every client I saw, I said, Hey, I'm going to take your concerns and lay them at the feet of Jesus, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it just makes me laugh to think of what might have happened. But in that, in that context, it was perfect and it was perfectly right. And, and it was just given to me as a wisdom, a bit of spiritual intelligence beyond the intellect. And so then later when I, when I found the principles, uh, I, I began to see the language that, that could explain it. That in, you know, in that moment of dropping thought and just being in stillness, divine thought came through and, and, and consciousness guided me to notice it, to really notice it and pay attention to it, uh, to not just dismiss it as a, you know, some sort of bizarre, weird thought that floated through my mind, but to really honor it and go with it. And, and that it was a pure, it was a pure bit of information from mind that, that had an impact that I never could have uh, could have guessed. Back then, even I would have said that what happened was that I had a moment of intuition. And I still like to use that term intuition. But I see it a little differently than I did then I, I really see that the way I think of intuition right now is that there are times when my spiritual eye flies open, and I see purely with the heart of love. And, and, and in those times, I see with crystal clarity, and that many times I see outside the boundaries of time, space, and matter. I once said to Sid Banks, this was kind of a funny conversation, because I knew I was intuitive. I knew I got visions. I knew I heard things. I knew I had premonitions. I knew I had, I had dreams that told me what was coming and what to do, and I didn't make a big deal out of them. I was more curious than anything, but... I, I was curious when I met Sid and he, surely he's a spiritual teacher and he would know how to explain these things that I experienced. 
So the first time I met him, we were having lunch in a restaurant and Bill went to the bathroom and Bill and I were just married. So we'd only known each other like seven or eight months at that point. And, and I didn't really share very much even with Bill about some of the intuitive things that I, that happened with, for me. And I thought, okay, Bill's out of the picture. I can ask Sid this question. So I, so I said to Sid, Sid, all my life I've had premonitions and sometimes they've saved my life or spared me from injury. Sometimes they've been information about other people. More often than not, they're things that help me know how to work with people therapeutically. What am I to make of those? What do the three principles say about those things? And Sid kind of straightened up a little bit across from me in the booth at the fish restaurant. And, and he said, um, kind of looked away and he looked at me and he looked at me really closely and he said, oh, dearie, I don't know. And I thought in my head, I'm thinking, what kind of answer is that from a spiritual teacher? You know, he lost a little bit of cred in that moment, I gotta tell you. And, and I looked at him and I thought, you don't know? Well, then Judy Banks, his wife, his, his second wife um, was sitting next to him. And Judy's just got this lively, sparkly eyes and she had got this little smile and she elbows Sid kind of, you know, hard in the, in the uh, ribs. And she says, Sid, you do too know. And, and Sid looked at her and he smiled and he said, okay, Judy, what do I know? And so Judy said, you know, Sid, that anybody can see outside the boundaries of time, space, and matter. It's not special. And my eyes get tearful as I think about that. And Sid turned and he looked at me and he said, that's right. Anybody can see outside the boundaries of time, space, and matter, Linda. It's not special. And then we went on, that was it. But I heard something really deep that day. I mean, I because I had, my ego had gotten a little bit into thinking that intuition and some of the things I experienced were kind of special. And there, were a lot, there was a lot of psychology to sort of reinforce that. You know, on the Myers-Briggs type indicator, I'm an INFJ, it's called the double I, the double introvert, the double person who listens really deeply to what's inside. And, and, and uh, that's, that's a, a, and that is the rarest of the personality types of the 16. It's the rarest. It's the, by research, the least often found. And so I had kind of been, you know, into this mode of thinking, oh, you know, <laughs> I have something on other people. But when Sid said that, I thought, no, he's right. He's right. This ability to access information from within the oneness, the, the oneness that unites us and connect us, connects us beyond the boundaries that we see in form, that's universally available. Now I may court it more and I may have had experiences that set me up for paying attention to it a little more, but it's available to all of us. And I think that's very powerful. And that's why I'm talking a lot these days about intuition because in these times of such chaos, in such uncertainty and such collapse of so many social understandings and economic and public health and, and, and social structures, I think a lot of people are looking for something to hold on to and looking for answers and that we do them a, a huge favor when we teach them to go inside and see through the eyes of love. And that's the only thing intuition is about. So I can connect that to talking about the lockdown thing, but before I do, I'm just gonna stop and ask if there are any questions about that story or comments about that story. Feel free to ask anything. Yeah, and I think we have so many, so please just unmute yourself if, uh, if you have a question because it's impossible for Linda to see all of you. Linda? Yes. But you know, as we met, as we met in Salt Spring Island, you told this story, and I have told about it so many times, and I get tears in my eyes every time. I love it, uh, and you're so beautiful when you talk about it. Thank you. 
Thank you. I think that was the first time I had ever told that story publicly. And I don't know why I, I, you know, I guess I just never thought of it as a, I don't know, as, as anything particularly pertinent to anyone but me going through clinical training. But through the years, as I, as I had opportunities to teach a lot of counseling and psychology students, I began, and again, when I found the principles and got a better language for it, I began to see that it was really relevant beyond me. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. It was a very, very beautiful story. I, at one time, I was working as a coach, kind of helping people to reconnect to the workforce, whatever. And th there was this guy, he, 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 he didn't come out, you know, he only at, at night. And he, he was so afraid people had been you know, he, he, he'd uh, run away from some gangs and stuff. So, but I had some, I had to talk to him once a week and, you know, and it started with him sitting like this, like uh, being afraid. And then we started connecting. And at one point he said, oh, I'd love to, I can't go out and I, I don't have any clothes. I don't have any shoes and I'd love to train, but I can't do that. My people might see me. So a day or two after I was down at the shop and I, and I spotted a, a pair of shoes and something in me said, buy them. And I, you know, I couldn't get the money to, I had to pay for it myself. So I bought these shoes and went back and said, look what I got for you. You know, I, no, I called him and what size do you use? And, and um, that he changed his life. He, he put on these shoes. And he started going to training, and I, I heard recently he's actually um, living a normal life now. <laughs> but I, and I didn't know at that time what what was going on. Why do I do this crazy thing? I couldn't explain <laughs> it to anyone. Yeah. But my boss certainly wouldn't allow it. But it just came through, like yeah, yeah no discussion. Buy them. <laughs> So that was what it reminded me of. I think everyone, some, um, you have these experiences that you don't yeah. know why, but, but it seems to work, it seems to work very well. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. What a beautiful story. <laughs> yeah. What a beautiful story. I think one of the biggest um, one of the biggest changes that occurred for me when I found the principles, uh, I as a therapist, I'd been doing therapy at that point for eighty three to ninety three, two thousand three, twenty five years, twenty four years maybe, and so when people would come in to see me as a psychologist. Um, I, one of the first things I wanted to do was listen really deeply to their stories. I sometimes, sometimes when people call me for appointments or they, they're on my schedule for appointments, it's not uncommon that, that people will start the, the call saying, well, I know I'm not supposed to tell my story. I know that in the three principles community, we're not about stories. And uh, so I won't tell you my story, but they're clearly like letting me know I want to tell you my story. <laughs> and I say to them, no, tell me the story. I want to hear the story. I want to hear what you are and who you are and what your life has been like and what your concerns are. And I, you know, I just love connecting with people and their stories. But what, so, so the three principles didn't change that for me. You know, I just really made it clear to people that I wanted to listen very deeply to their stories. But what it did change was that as I was listening, I was listening to how is love coming through this story? Where is love coming through this story? Where is beauty oh, coming through this story? Where is truth coming through this story? 
And, and so then when I responded to people, I would say to them, okay, so first of all, let me make sure that I've got your story as accurately as possible. This is what is important to you about it. And then I would tell them, I heard this, I heard this, I heard this feeling. I did all this, all the counseling skills, using all the counseling skills I'd been trained in. And after I was sure that they felt heard, when they got to the point where they said, yeah, you've got it, you understand, you, you get it. Then I would say, but I got to tell you, I heard something else in your story. You told me about how much love is inside of you. You told me about how much wisdom you have about what you need. You told me about ways in which you have stood for the truth. You have stood in the truth and you have stood for the truth. And this is where I heard it. And then I would give it back. And inevitably, nine out of 10 times when I was finished, the person would be sitting in the chair and it would be like the life force started to flow more cleanly through them because they'd be sitting up and their shoulders would be back and they'd be holding their head a little higher and they'd be looking at me straight and they would say, I told you that? And I said, yeah, and here's where. And there would be this sudden consciousness of something that they just hadn't recognized before. It was there, it was there, but they were unconscious to it. And it, it brought about this sort of shift in what they saw about themselves and what they saw about their own stories. And then rarely after that, did we have to talk very much about the story, maybe here and there in a little bit, but not because I wouldn't go there, but because they left it behind. And they were much more interested in what would, what could come about what they could see about how love, truth, and beauty was manifesting in their life and how they could experience more of that. So that was really beautiful. It's like, it, it's like, um, Chris, your story about the shoes reminded me of that, that clients do that all the time, that in the quiet, in the stillness, in the place of love, in the place where they feel held, that they start getting information about their own stories to tell me that then helps me find the launching place for talking with them about the principles. I had a conversation with Sid once. He called our house frequently. He called, uh, not to, to, so much to speak to me, be clear about that. He called to speak to Bill because Bill was one of his primary teachers and, and he was very interested in, in in helping Bill along in his journey because Bill was a psychiatrist and he very much wanted to impact the field of psychiatry. Not that Sid didn't care about me and he would often say when he called, put me on speakerphone and then we would listen to Sid. We'd lay on the bed on Sunday and Sid would call and spend a couple hours just teaching us. And, but there were a couple of times when he called and I just had these little conversations with him. And this one, I said, you know, Sid, I, I, I want, this was probably two years into knowing Bill. I said, I want to reopen my psychotherapy practice. I had closed it. And I want to go back and share what I've learned about the three principles, but I don't know that I see enough. And Sid got really quiet and I could kind of hear that he was a little tearful. And he said, oh, Linda, what people need is so little. What people need is so little and they will tell you what they need. They, if you listen deeply enough, they will reveal the key. They will reveal the keyhole. And all you have to do is take the principles and insert the key in the lock and turn it just ever so little and it will be unlocked for them. And I came to trust that I can and oh, then he added, just, just share from your heart because what you share from your heart cannot fail to go directly into the heart of the other person. And what I understand about that now is that in a way he was saying, this is not about you, Linda, trust the understanding. It's the understanding 
that has the power. And if you share it to the best of your ability, from your heart, what you've seen, its power is not deniable. And sometimes we don't even know how, how deeply it impacts people. If you see behind me, there's a picture with a woman on it that's got kind of a gold thing around her head. That's a Benedictine monk's rend rendition, rendering of Mary Magdalene, who the Catholic Church, unfortunately, um, slotted into the role of prostitute. She was not that. You know, the Gospels of that time tell us that she was Jesus's most beloved disciple. She has an egg in her hand because one of her central teachings is that the egg contains the whole. The seed contains the whole. And so all we have to do is plant the seed, do our best to plant the seed, throw the seed, surround it with love, nourish it with proverbial water and sunlight, and we have no control over whether it grows or how fast it grows. And that's, re that's really a beautiful thing. It, it, it heartens me. It, it's like it, it gives me a sort of passion for being a, th a seed thrower. With no investment in the outcome. So I'll share a little bit about how I feel about the lockdown situation. <clears throat> and then I'll try to just do that short and then s sort of stop for questions and conversation for those who want to stay with, with it. I, first of all, I don't like the term lockdown. It kind of implies something that feels real like restrictive and, you know, awful. Uh, I much prefer the term shelter in place. And that's the way I think about this, that I've been sheltering in place for, good God, almost a year. <laughs> I've barely got out of my house here in over a year, almost a year. <clears throat> but I, here's the way I think about it. Years ago, when I was uh, very young, in my 20s, and I first started flying for business, I was, I was in public relations, and I had the incredible opportunity as a very young person to be flying around the United States primarily, a little bit internationally, but in Canada, but mostly in the United States. And I remember that when the bird would lift off and we got into the sky, I would have this feeling of incredible freedom because I was very busy, I had a very demanding job, had a very demanding social life. You know, I was, a, I was kind of always been a scholar. And so I was doing all kinds of things that are related to scholarship and writing. And, and, but when I got into the sky, I would think, oh, no one can call me. No one can reach me. I don't have to do anything. I'm belted into this seat. All I have to do all, is sit here and look out the window and enjoy the sky and the clouds and a great gin and tonic. If it wasn't too early in the morning, <laughs> I did have my rules, you know, though the gin and tonics have to come, had to come after noon. <clears throat> but I, I thought, what a beautiful feeling. And I, I recently found something in a book called The Art of Stillness, where the author, who's a very recognized spiritual teacher, said something really similarly. Someone, someone said to him, teacher, you don't seem to suffer from jet lag. And he said, no, because when I'm in the sky, no one can reach me. No one can ask me to speak. No one can demand anything of me. So I go on retreat. And I watch the clouds. And I watch what is both still and unmoving and what is unceasingly moving. And so when I get to my destination, I've had a retreat. I feel great. 
And that's kind of the way I see sheltering in place that it's, it's an opportunity for all of us to more deeply appreciate silence and stillness. You know, there in the book, um, Encounters with an Enlightened Man by Linda Quiring, and some of you may have heard me say this before, but it, 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 I was reading it. Um, so early in the shelter in place order here, I thought to myself, I have more quiet time that I usually, and I usually am cust- accustomed to because my business fell off for a little while and then it really picked up. I'm going to go back and read every book that Sid Banks wrote. And I'm also going to read the three books that Linda Quiring wrote because I love them. I love Beyond Beliefs and Islands of Knowledge. Those were books she wrote with Sid. And, and then a little while later, toward the end of that, I was reading her book, Encounters with an Enlightened Man, where she talks about her experience of Sid. And Linda, uh, Linda and Sid had a falling out, apparently. I don't know a lot about it, but it was primarily because Linda felt Sid got more psychological in his teaching than spiritual. And uh, before Sid's death, they reunited and they had a number of conversations. And Sid, Sid said to her one time, tell me, Linda, why you were so upset about the later books that I wrote. And Sid, Linda said, because it just seemed so psychological. It seemed like the deep spiritual truths you were speaking about, you didn't speak to them quite as clearly or quite as purely. And as Linda reports it, twice, Sid got very tearful and he looked at her and he said, Linda, I couldn't help them hear and see the silence. The best I could do was give them a metaphor, but they still don't hear and see the silence. And he got tearful twice about that. So silence, stillness, what was he talking about? What was he talking about? Well, I I think it's that place we go to kind of an aliveness inside, the more pure consciousness, the more pure access to mind, the more pure access to divine thought, where there's, there's just this peaceful aliveness And in that peaceful aliveness, newness comes forth and we can see things from new perspectives. I I read about a man who, I I was trying to get the uh, source for this book and I couldn't before this call. So if I get it, I'll post it to someone so someone can share it. And maybe it's not that important, but this man was speaking to someone about how um, he was feeling really bored in life. And, and they got to talking about his bike ride. I guess he took a bike ride every day of like 30 minutes through the, through the streets of New York. And, and this man's friend said to him, are you kidding? How could you ever be bored taking a 30 minute bike trip through the streets of New York? There's so much to see. And it's never the same. And the man who was hearing this just really heard it. It it just intrigued him. So the next day he went on his bike ride. And and what happened was that he started to take his bike ride through with quiet and presence. And suddenly he was seeing things that he had never seen before. So I'll give you one example. He noticed manhole covers. Manhole covers, those things in the city, you know, those that are kind of like over the belly of the tunnels and systems that go underneath the city that, you know, often in cop stories, people try to hide under the manhole covers or escape through the manhole system, the, the, you know, the system under the city. But he saw them and he got really curious and he said, oh, my gosh, they look different, something. They're not always the same. And wonder what's up with that who discovered manholes or or created manholes and what's underneath the manholes and this set him off on this whole journey of learning about manholes and manhole covers there believe it or not i googled it there actually is a book on manhole covers 
And the point of that was that what he said was from that day forward, his ride was never boring because he had learned to look through the eyes of soft stillness in presence at what was fresh and new in every moment. And I think that's the opportunity for those of us who are sheltering in place is to go very slow and look very deeply. Uh, I read a quote this morning from the Dalai Lama. I posted it on my Facebook feed where he said something like, the question is not what is the meaning of your life? The question is what meaning do you bring to the life you've been given? Well, we've all been given these lives right now that are a little restricted, aren't they? They're a little closer to home and they're a little closer to family. And if you're like me, you're, you're seeing the person you're married to 24 <laughs> seven. And you maybe don't have much contact with any other people. And, and there's this opportunity to sort of slow down and look at things that in life, I've, I've gotten really cut good these last nine months at the meditative art of peeling carrots. So when I'm last night, I was peeling carrots and I'm, you know, using the peeler and thinking, oh man, they, that's such an incredible smell, such an incredible fragrance, the smell of carrots being peeled. And I had just that day read that carrots are one of the top nutritious foods in all, of all human foods. It's one of the top 20. And I, Whoa. The creation of a carrot. You get my, so you get my drift. It's kind of like that story of the catatonic man slowing down to presence, slowing down to what's in front of us, so, slowing down. And I've had so many people say to me that they, in this time, they've learned to appreciate their children more deeply. They've learned to appreciate their partners more deeply. They've learned to, to, to just see little ordinary things with, with much deeper awareness. They've come to enjoy silence and quiet more. And yes, there's all the other things. I'm not, I'm not a saint. The last thing I am is a saint. There are days when I think if I have to look at Bill's face one more day without any other face to look at, I'm going to scream. And there are days when I think if I can't get out of my car for a while and take a ride, I'm going to go friggin' nuts. And there are days when I think, oh my God, I haven't seen my mama in over a year. She lives up in Michigan and she's 90 years old. Will I ever be able to hug her again? So yeah, I have all those thoughts and all the feelings that go with them. But for me anyway, they pale in comparison to what, what this time has taught me and showed me, what, what an opportunity it's been. Oh, one, one last thing. So there is a place in, in Beyond Beliefs where Sid is asked, uh, or Sid's, Sid is asked about what we're supposed to do about all the things going on in the world. And, and interestingly, Sid says, says one of the things he says that really stuck with me, he said, we are no important, no more important than a grain of sand on the Sahara Desert. So get over yourself and what you can do or not do. None of us is any more important than a grain of sand on the Sahara Desert. That was really helpful to me. It's like, took the pressure off. Okay, I can get over this urgency bit about anything I need to do about anything that's going on. If I listen to the silence, I'll know if there's something for me to do. But then he went on to say something very interesting. He said, in this world, there will always be takers and givers and there will always be helpers. And that's a really beautiful thing to be a helper. And there will always be those who are apprentices to the silence and they have chosen the best path. Wow. Wow, and they have chosen the best path. Now, I'm not a cloistered nun, I wanted to be. So I'm, you know, I, I have no illusions that I'm not an apprentice to the silence. If I was, I wouldn't have been speaking to you for an hour. But 
but I love that it it's something I hold in my head, you know, every day. How how can I be an apprentice to the silence? What does it mean to hold the silence for the world? What does it mean to hold the world in love? And I just have to trust that Sid knew that that was the most important thing we can do. And that given, given this shelter in place time that it's an opportunity for all of us to do it and to hold it and to carry it forward into the next phase that we'll move to. I don't know about you, but I will never again take for granted hugging another person. I am sure that every hug I give will be full present, full present, full body, full of love because, because, because that's one of the lessons of this time. So I'll stop there. Any thoughts, questions, comments? I have a comment. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I'm looking for you too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 30 years ago, I was in the hospital and I was lying in bed. And at that time, there was no television or anything at the, in the rooms. Wow. And we were four men who was lying there in that room. And... Um, there was nothing to do, so I, I was just lying there. And all of a sudden, I fell into a really, really lovely space. Mm -hmm. um, it was really beautiful. And uh, it's many years ago, so I don't remember how long I was there, but some of my friends came to visit me and they brought some, some, uh, some uh, magazines. <laughs> And when they left, I uh, caught myself thinking, what of these magazines uh, that I don't like to read, am I going to read? <laughs> kind of what we are doing with all these gadgets and things today. But it was about the, the stillness that you, you were talking about. And also I have a little story. I had a girlfriend many years ago and uh, when we were together, many times she fell into things that she had um, um, suppressed so she couldn't remember, but she got all those pictures and she was uh, lying stiff and couldn't talk and anything. And uh, at that time, it came to me that we could communicate by pressing the hand. Mm -hmm. So one pressure was uh, yes, and two was no. Yeah. So that way, we went through all what she was experiencing, and I helped her a lot that time. Wow. Yeah. It's a powerful communication. Yeah. 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 Wow. wow. Yeah, that was it. Beautiful. It's interesting, you know, your thought, what your, your story, Lars, really touched me and the story about falling into that quiet and it reminded me of something I read years ago about, it was a kind of a group, a group of stories about people who'd been in um, iron lungs because they had polio and how, how you know, it's, it's interesting how uh, a lot of us would look at that, maybe me even at one point in my life and say, oh, this person who is in this iron lung and can't do anything, is that life as meaningful as other lives where, where people are able to be more productive in the sense of doing things in the outer world. And what I remember, what I remember from the book is people talking about what they saw in that place, the beauty that they saw 
and how how much it filled them up and 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 how how alive their inner world was and how it had really sustained them the aliveness of it and again it's that you know that said pointing to that and saying that's that's the best life it it just sort of defies a lot of our conceptual thinking about what makes for a meaningful life. Some of you um, may know that I have a blog and there's a blog post on my blog. It's called Pearls of Wisdom. It's actually not my story. It's a story that I wrote after a woman on Salt Spring who knew Sid very, very well, uh, kind of out of the blue, contacted me and said, I want to tell you something that happened with Sid. And fast forwarding to the end of the story, she talks about how she's gotten hit in her later life with a, a chronic lung ailment that's very rare. And it's prevented her from doing the work she loved and from having a very active life. But she said something that I thought was really beautiful. She said, in the last four or five years of my life, I've been living the ministry of silence. And I have evolved forward more than at any other point in my life. And, and I know that I've made more of a contribution to the world in the last four years of my life than at any other time. Now, I don't pretend to understand the mystery of that, but I know she was telling the truth. So for us moderns, you know, us people out there who are health, physically healthy and have beautiful families, and yes, we're struggling with all kinds of things. You know, I, I have children and grandchildren, and I see what my children and grandchildren are going through, trying to make it through this time. But, but also there's been right alongside that, this sense of how rich we are. and how much richness there is. Well, are there any more questions? Because I thought that that was a beautiful note to finish this, this extraordinary webinar on. And I, I, I don't think I exaggerate when I say this has been one of the most moving webinars we've ever had in the Danish community. Um, so it has been a pure pleasure listening to you. Um, that's very fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I don't, I don't think something beautiful can happen unless it's a, it's a, it's a shared presence. So I know that anything that came out of me was because of the shared presence here in the space. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. And thank you very much, everybody, for showing up.